Spending $400 on a pocket knife is an absolutely crazy idea. Spending that kind of money on a knife made in the People's Republic of China is mind-boggling. Why do people do it? One word, collectors. And as a collector or enthusiast for your money, you expect an outstanding experience from ordering to receiving the package to opening the box and filling the knife in your hand for the first time. What you don't expect is a flimsy manila envelope clad in a plastic bag. I think there is absolutely no excuse that this knife, Kunwu Excalibur, came in a damaged box. This kind of little bit of damage, I probably wouldn't even notice on a cheaper brand like Vastid or Fintizo box, which, by the way, did not come damaged, and I reviewed quite a few of their knives. Kunwu positioned itself as a collector's or enthusiast or connoisseur's brand. And for that kind of brand, damaged box upon arrival is not really acceptable. So guys, please take care in your future shipments. While I'm not a big fan of too much paraphernalia in the boxes shipped with knives, I do welcome the baggy of spare parts. We'll get to them later. Whew. Uh, yeah, so my flow of complaining stops when I pull the knife out. If you are a Star Wars fan like I am, you would feel like looking at Queen Amidala's starship from planet Naboo for the first time. Except maybe for the oil pouring out of every crevasse, but it's okay, we can deal with that easily. The J-Type 327 Nubian Royal Starship was developed by the Theed Palace Space Vessel Engineering Corps as a joint venture between them and the Nubia Star Drives Incorporated. And continuing with the Star Wars analogy, this is definitely not a pleasure yacht. It's a full-up battle cruiser dressed up as a pleasure yacht. Because even though it looks elegant, it weighs in at 164 grams or 5.8 ounces. It is larger and heavier than other Kunwus in my collection, like this Django and uh, Estelle. It is comparable in size, though, to the Ironfly Superfly, Ironfly being a budget line of Kunwu, which, by the way, weighs 35 grams or 1.1 ounces less than the Excalibur. What else can we compare it to? How about this full-size Ritter Hogue, or in this case, Benchmade Griptilian? And maybe let's put my personal favorite out of the entire Spyderco lineup, Manix 2 Lightweight. Hmm, it actually looks more similar than I expected side by side. Really unexpected turn of events here. Look at that. I don't know. What do you guys think? How about everybody else's Spyderco favorite, the Shaman? A beefy banger, which actually weighs. 0.7 ounces less still than the Excalibur. How about taking a look at small batch production American knives next to it, like TRM Atom or this American Blade Works Model 2, both of which have titanium construction and magnet cut blades yet cost less than the Excalibur. And what about American knives that are more expensive in a premium category? Here's my Nkosi, Sabenza, and uh, Omnizom trio, all of which are still lightweight comparing to the Excalibur. All right, let's throw some heavyweights into the ring here. Here's Mini Praetorian T and its big brother, Praetorian T. Now we're talking beef, bacon wrapped beef on top of mashed potatoes followed by an apple pie. <sighs> it looks like I just added another Chinese knife to my collection. I'll go through this review super quickly so that nobody else gets bored. Of course I'm freaking kidding. Are you nuts? This is Kunu's like most anticipated knife ever. I am going to deep dive into it, find out what it is literally made of, and share it all with you in more than one video. Here's the logo. Looks like a knight's helmet with five horns. As a horny knight. There's Kunwu logo on the pivot and nothing, no writing at all on the blade. A couple earlier reviewers of this knife complained about the pocket clip. We'll check it out. Uh, it being hard to use and kind of being sharp. That's what I heard. It's a Zerkatai pocket clip. And uh, as you can see, it has a ramp and the ramp is rather pointy. I don't think that's 
in itself is a problem. This ramp on the S tower is less pointy, but this one is pointy. But I don't think that's a key problem here. Uh, this pocket clip is like perfect in function for two reasons. This surface here is completely flat and it's longer. So when it acts as a spring, because it's flat, there is no stress concentration on top. This guy is contoured, which is very pleasant in hand, and I totally understand why it's done, but it increases the spring coefficient, and the span here is much shorter, which also adds the amount of force that your pocket seam has to contend with when you're trying to pocket the knife. So the combination of these two engineering factors makes uh, this spring or this pocket clip awesome, and this one uh, kind of hard to deal with. Here's what I'm talking about. Putting it into the thick, I have to really press it down. Let me do it with one hand. It goes in into the reinforced, uh, reinforced section. Here's a thin unreinforced section. And here it's really cutting in. You could hear it. Uh, it. I don't remember which knife did it, not this one, but you will end up with something resembling this. They did include this spring Spyderco style pocket clip. For those of us who are fake knife enthusiasts and value their pants way too much as compared to the cool factor of having Zorkotite pocket clip. Well, I guess I'll have to sacrifice pants in the name of beauty. It is very nice, very nice detail. All right, so what else came with the knife while we edit? The coolest thing, the piece de resistance is this spare lock bar insert. These parts are expensive, and they clearly are concerned about you losing this screw because it's attached on the exterior due to the integral nature of the knife, and potentially they fear it may come loose and fall off. Now, question is, will the new one interface properly with the blade because usually it requires adjustment? Has somebody tried that? I'd like to know how it went. But uh, today I am not trying that out. So. And fortunately, this pocket clip scores zero points for pocket insertion and extraction. But let's see if it scores one on my acceleration test. Hmm, that is interesting. I guess the stud caught on something. Um, yeah, so it's not uh, falling out. And while I'm here, I'm going to count the ways I can open this knife without flicking the wrist or adding any inertia to it. So really good opening with a thumb stud um, and uh, decent opening with a uh, slot here, using the slot. Let's see. Um, reverse flick through the slot is great and it's not possible. I could not find a good way to use the backside um, thumb stud to use my middle finger. Let's try. No. So these thumb studs are actually also stop pin. This is one of the strongest ways to secure the blade because it creates a very nice fulcrum arm or shoulder between the stud itself, the surface and the pivot. And it's opposite to the engagement surface here. So this is an extremely strong connection, maybe superseded by a uh, triad lock, but uh, you know, this is very strong. So I have no doubt it will pass my hype smasher test, which it will have to go through like everybody else. Okay, where are we? Oh, let's take some critical measurements. In most states where the blade length is regulated, it's measured from the extremity of the handle to the tip of the blade right here. And this knife presents a problem because the thumb stud is a little bit in the way of that. So I have to come out to this corner here and let me use some kind of straight edge to get the measurement. Kunwu S Tau is a perfect straight edge right there. And I got three and three quarter inch or 95 ish millimeters. Here's a proper way to measure the cutting edge length. You start at the chow, back of the blade, and then roll it along the ruler in order to get the full curvature included in the length. And we end up just under three and three quarter inches. 
which is 3 and 23 30 seconds. God, I love Imperial units. Or 94 and a half millimeters. So I would like you guys to appreciate that whoever designed the blade shape compensated for the quarter inch loss due to finger chop, making the edge length almost equal to the blade length. And while we are here, I'm going to measure the practical edge. By that I mean I place my index finger here and I'm emulating cutting on the cutting board like slicing food. And when my knuckle hits the board, that's a stop. And then I identify where we at on the blade, which is two and one eighth of an inch, which in turn is more than half of the blade's length, giving us an extra point. That is an awesome design feature. One more way I forgot to show you, it totally uh, works with the lefty flick. So if you're lefty and this pocket clip is not reversible, uh, you're carrying a knife like that in your left pocket. And when you pull it out, you can totally, uh, and of course I screwed it up on camera. You can totally open it like this and grip it where it's actually safe, which makes it readily available for some defensive move or just to impress your buddies. Uh, now, let me do it with my strong hand because it looks a lot more spectacular. Yeah, like this. So, and it's in the right place to grip. My hands are medium to large gloves, uh, slightly leaning toward medium. And now I think it's time you hit the like button if you like the video or dislike if you don't. Likes versus dislikes is a valuable stat when I make my videos. So we already established that it flicks really well, but uh, for the sake of science, we will document the exact uh, force that's required. Uh, we're going to go in pounds. We'll use the thumb stud first. I'm pressing this 1.8 pounds. My ideal force is between 1.2 and 4 pounds. And, well, didn't re-zero it, bet on me, zero. And let's see, uh, 1.6, so it was still within the range. And don't worry, this is not a scratch, this is aluminum. There's no way aluminum item will scratch this DLC coating. So now let's get into the more meaty tests, which will include the hype smasher, the hardness check, the toughness and durability check, the usual works. To me, the heart of a knife is its blade and the sole of the blade is the edge. So let's see how professionally is this knife sharpened. Zooming in, oh boy. I, don't you hate it when right off the bat you see something like this unremoved sharpening burr and the rounded off tip? Not by much, but rounded off nevertheless. How about the other side? Yeah, more burr. Not particularly fine grit they used to sharpen it. So that begets a pretty rough burr. Personally, Vanex being what it is, I would take it to a higher grit sharpening medium, maybe 800. This looks like 600 to me. 800,000 maybe. You know, it's supposed to be a sort of showy knife, so why not put a mirror polish? Hmm? Instead of the burr, it'd definitely be an improvement. Anyway, you can see the secondary bevel narrows a little bit on the right side of the blade, meaning the angle changes slightly. And uh, let's see the other side here. This one looks a little more consistent. So this side has a consistent secondary bevel angle. Don't know what happened to the other side. Probably they started on this side and then they flipped it over on the other side and never checked whether or not the burr was completely removed. The burr looks weak. You will, I'll show you in a second here when we get to the tip. That's a good thing, meaning it would strop off easily, but I don't strop before testing the edge retention, which is coming up in the next segment. All right, here I'm gonna pause and let you in on a big secret. My advertisement revenue from YouTube, the ads that you see, pay me $8 per 1,000 views. That means that for me to compensate myself for the purchase of this knife, I would need to get 50,000 views on this video. That is not going to happen because I think my highest viewed video 
is still a little bit below 50,000. Another thing about my channel, I don't provide links to knives. I don't affiliate with knife companies, retailers or makers. And so I don't have that kind of revenue that other YouTubers do get. I do that to remain unaffiliated and completely independent so that I can continue delivering you honest, no BS reviews. That's why I decided to start a channel membership. There are three levels in that membership. They start at $3.99, then $5.99, and $6.99. And at those levels, you will get very few perks. One perk you will get is I'm going to publish some of my videos exclusively to the members for a couple of days. And then 24 to 48 hours later, everyone else will be able to see them. So really, none of my viewers, none of my subscribers will miss out on anything it's just they will get to see the content that members will see on the day of the release. They'll get to see it a couple days later. Uh, my, uh, there's no other perks. 99.9% .9 of everything I produce will be eventually available to everybody. I might have some targeted uh, surveys that I will address to my members. And uh, this is the second video where I announced it. I uh, got seven members from my first video. I sincerely appreciate their contribution and uh, hoping that this trend will continue. So I'm pausing the video right here. This part became available to everyone on day one. And the second chapter to this saga will be available to the members on the same day and to everybody else 24 to 48 hours later. So don't forget to check out my membership link, which will be in the description.